Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second panel of Net at Work. It's great pleasure to have you back, and it's great pleasure for me to host the second panel of our exciting, exciting day. I'm Tommy Huhtanen. I'm executive director of the Martin Center. And it's my great pleasure to to moderate the panel, staying staying subsidiary, getting stronger, hosted by Corona Denial Foundation and Political Academy of uh, of Austria. These are challenging times. On the other, we are looking. Uh, we are looking at the Corona challenge. We are looking the EU taking new position uh, geopolitically. Politically. On the other hand, we have the regions uh, uh, and, and people who are attached to re regions and uh, impassionate about doing uh, politics. So you have this uh, tension. At the turn, which defines this dynamic, is subsidiarity. Subsidiary meaning that the central force of the uh, of central political force, which is the European Union, is a subsidiary and only engaged when there is a need for European Union to engage. Subsidiarity, it's a term which flows a little bit. Every three, four years, it comes, uh, comes back. Uh, last time, it happened around 2016, where there was a lot of discussion about Brexit, about uh, populism. And so there was the question of, of how subsidiarity could help. EU being big on big issues and small on uh, smaller issues. As a result, Austrian presidency on last part of the 2018 took subsidiarity as one of, the, of its priorities. Also, Juncker, Juncker's commission made a task force on subsidiarity, uh, task force on subsidiarity, proportionality, and doing less more efficiently. And in 2018, then finally, this task, task for presented its uh, results. But there was uh, some, some criticism saying that the task force didn't really lay out what powers should be in the EU level, what should be in the regional, uh, regional level. And after that, after that presentation of that task uh, force results, in fact, you could say the discussion of subsidiarity faded away. So that's our uh, starting point. We start by speaking about subsidiarity, what it means in today's politics, and in the second part we go for more general issues, what the subsidiarity means in the discussion of future of Euros, Europe. As we know, there's a, a conference on future of Europe coming up, and, and this our discussion very nicely relates to that, that, uh, that issue. We have three uh, panelists, and, uh, and I think this is an excellent setting for our debate. First of all, Elmar Brock, who has been nearly 40 years as, as, as a member of the European Parliament, all possible uh, positions, chaired discussions about the future, being the EPP's uh, uh, spokesman so many times, is really a person who knows not only the concept, but the full story. We have Ingrid steiner Kashi who is a report, journalist, a reporter, and working for Austrian newspaper, Courier, who has made very interesting articles and points about subsidiarity, especially in these time of, uh, times of Corona. And we have Franz Schauersberger, who is uh, an Austrian politician. Um, he he has, he's a former governor of Salzburg. Um, he's also academic. Uh, he has been founder of Institute of the Region of of Europe, he has been advisor of uh, EU Commissioner Johannes Hahn and and a member of Committee of Regions. So really, person who knows uh, the, the the aspect of regional politics and its related relation to European Union. So, uh, thank you, panelists. Thank you for coming. I'm so excited about this uh, discussion. So I start with Elmar Brock, uh, Mr. Brock. Uh, and provocatively, does this really discussion of subsidiarity now now really make make sense? If you look at today's discussion about the multi-annual multi -annual, annual financial framework, you have an impression that the EU is molded by huge classes of interest uh, and conflicts. Uh, what is the uh, importance of concept of subsidiarity today? Is it about certain principles on how we build the European Union, or is it more about interest? So subsidiarity is role today. Mr. Brock. Thank you very much. Subsidiarity is a value uh, in my understanding out of the Catholic social teaching, which means that everyone who is for, uh, responsible for his own, uh, for himself 
and for his family, and that the responsibility should go only to a higher level if a lower level is not able to deal with that properly. And therefore, uh, I am very much against the European Union, which is centralized. Hemel Kohl once has said, uh, his home region, Palatine, is his home. Germany is his fatherland and Europe is the future. And we have to see that not in a competition. We have seen that on levels uh, where things can be better done. Let me make an example out of Corona time. I was once again convinced of uh, the from the uh, decentralized system. We call it the federal system, but in English understanding, it's the opposite. That is one of our problems uh, that in words have in uh, languages different meanings. Uh, but it means that, for example, in Germany, the health system is not even national responsibility. It's the responsibility of the regions. And we have in Germany a certain competition between uh, uh, hospitals, which might be private ones, which might be short ones, which might be uh, state ones, city ones. And we had here a much better uh, situation in Germany at the moment and we had in centralized countries uh, where they have centralized health systems. Like in Great Britain, where the national health system centralized is a catastrophe for the people. So please never go away from this decentralized system. But when I see that comes from the Christian social teaching, then we have to see that subsidiarity has a sister. This sister is called solidarity. It's always together. We discuss only subsidiarity in the EPP for a moment, but we lose there the other point, solidarity, and make it clear with the Corona package. I think Germany could in a, uh, get the opinion they can solve the problem themselves because they're rich enough, or Austria too. But uh, on the other side, we have to see they have to help the other Europeans to come out of that crisis too, both in the question of resilience of the health system as well as the economic question. But now it comes in one step forward. We have to this see this combination. But also the, uh, Germany will not come out alone. The German economic recovery is only possible if also the other European countries come out of that economic crisis caused uh, by Corona. And uh, because our um, economies are so interdependent within the internal market uh, that uh, this has to be done together so that we can sometimes have a difficulty to understand what is solidarity, what its own interest. I believe uh, uh, that in Germany we had a wrong debate for some time that we said, oh, we help all the others who do not the right job and we have to finance it all ourselves. It was also the discussion by the prudent four in that debate. Uh, but you have to see then only if we do certain things together, we have a common progress by that, a common advantage. Uh, the, the common wealth is only to seen if we have this combination of subsidiarity and solidarity. Uh, and the European level should done only that. What can be done on a European level better than a national region can do that? That is part of the treaty. And therefore, I'm against uh, that automatically always is asked to get more uh, EU competence. But when the European Union has competence, then we have to give the European Union also the money and the instruments to do that. And we have to see the things in between where we, for example, do not change uh, uh, certain economic responsibilities on a national level or, or responsibilities for the health systems, but where we have to cooperate in certain questions to solve it. I made for the EPP group the written uh, 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 amendment to the Constitutional Convention to uh, give in times of pandemies the European Commission certain possibilities to act. This was rejected by Berlin, by Paris and others, because it was said, oh, that has nothing to do with Europe, it's national competence. 
uh, it would have been nice if we would have d agreed on that already at that time and now not to have to try to correct certain things uh, outside the treaties and here i think we see that we have seen always this combination and uh, we have to see also that we need decision not only the money but also the decision making process uh, when we see that in certain questions we have still qmv then is this the instrument which is costly and uh, uh, gives chances for blackmailing? We see this very practically in these days with a disastrous result on richer and poorer countries and regions. And uh, here, when Europe should, uh, do, uh, should something to do, they have to do it in a way that they can be effective. And here we have to look into our decision-making procedures. Uh, in the construction, we have the balance between uh, 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 na nation states and, and the European Union. We have the European Parliament, which is the Parliament of the Centre. And we have a Council in the Second Chamber, when the Council is acting as legislator, where the interests of the nation states or regions are um, looked after and only if these two institutions agree legislation is possible that is the classical way as we have it in all federal states from the united states to germany and i think also in austria in a certain way and uh, in switzerland for example and other countries and i think that should be also clear i as a former member of european parliament would be against solutions which brings only the european parliament as legislator it must be always parliament and council council as representative of that level and here uh, let me make a, a last remark on this point uh, we have also to look how can we do it in the future uh, we have uh, you have here a later panel where you talk about uh, enlargement of the european union before the last enlargement we have said we have to deepen the European Union to make it more effective before we enlarge it. That was at the end via the Treaty of Lisbon done. Uh, not enough, but it was progress. And we have to discuss it now also in that way. Is the further enlargement possible uh, uh, if there's not changes in our procedures? Uh, in, when we have all Western Balkan countries in the European Union, we would have 33 countries. This with QMV in such question as budget, I think would be a catastrophe. And the Kosovo would have a veto against the European budget or a Corona package. So we have to consider that. And I think we need a broader debate about the right relationship of subsidiarity and solidarity and how via that way we can europe stronger thank you thank you mr brock uh very interesting points let's come back later let's come back later to this question of the increasing tension between eu the member states and the region and whether whether there is more or less tension and how to handle it but uh, next time we'll no, 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 that's one uh, word uh, one word Tensions there will be always. That is normal life. Since we got the apple in paradise, we have tensions between ourselves. We have to look for solutions despite that spent tensions, which will never go. Good. My name is Steiner Gassi. Looking now Corona times, we see many issues moving. We need new needs. We uh, for example, uh, tackling COVID epidemic, we see uh, we see, of course, the increasing uh, demand for EU to take a global role. How do you see that? What is the because I have a, in your articles you have have taken this point the subsidiarity on the other hand and then the the needs and the competence the European Union would need to handle certain challenges. So how how do you see how should we balance out? Well, um, in, the, in the last days, I have asked all my friends, literally all my friends, about what, what, what exactly is subsidiarity? How, how do you see it? What does that mean? 
And I tell you, absolutely nobody knew what that, that means on the European level. So uh, I guess, as Mr. Brock said before, uh, subsidiarity is a value or a kind of ideological principle, but really nobody knows on the ground what that means. But as we said before, it is a kind of, um, uh, it's the level of decision making that would mean that the European Council, uh, the, 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 the Commission can do whatever they can do and the Council can do what they can do and the Parliament can do what they can do. And um, that should not be, there should not be too much meddling around and um, Brussels should be stopped by implementing too many things that can be decided on the national level. That's it. And I think that in principle it is that. Subsidiarity means that the national governments want to stop too much influence or too much power or too much meddling in from Brussels. I, I guess that's what it is. Huh? And uh, as we see now, as we have seen in the Corona crisis, we have a problem. Um, we have a clear, we have decided, okay, social, social things and health things are on the national level. But what we have seen also is that the cooperation, at least at the beginning of the, of the Corona crisis, didn't, didn't work out. It didn't at all. It was, it was horrible. We had these traffic jams on the borders. We had them um, closing of our borders and everybody protecting its own society or our own national, which is, which is right. But in, in fact, as we are a union, it didn't work out. So it took some time and it took also um, the initiative of the Commission to, to ask for common solutions. And uh, step by step by step now we are improving and as we can see uh, the, the waxing uh, strategy that, that is working out very well, that we, we are making progress. But this is, I don't know whether this is an, a good example for subsidiarity, now the Commission is, uh, is taking the initiative, so is taking away the, the power or uh, empowerment from the national governments. So this, that means that now the, the, the decision making process is going to a higher level. And is this a good example for subsidiarity? No, I don't think so, because now that the, 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 the Commission is, is having is having their say and this is exactly what the, what the, the national governments did not want to have at the beginning they want to have as much power as possible and as little power from the side from the commission so um i guess our way of of doing politics is just uh, uh learning step by step and also fulfilling this this idea of subsidiarity with life and there is no, no written eternal answer for the moment. This is just a kind of progressing day by day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, by the way, you, uh, you can leave your comments up, uh, in, in your Facebook. We are following that. Uh, comments, questions will take you in the, in the discussion. Uh, Mr. Sausberger. Madame Steinel Garci mentioned the issue, the classical issue on, of subsidiarity. Everybody agrees, but nobody knows exactly what does it mean. So in the beginning, in my introduction, I was maybe a little bit uh, provocative on the, on the work of the task force and, and uh, you know, questioning a little bit what the Austrian presidency, when they had that priority on subsidiarity, what was the end result? So how about you? How did you see that? Because I know that you followed very carefully and in fact, you were part of that that process. So how do you see the results of those discussions and how they, what they have implemented uh, to the development of the European Union now a couple of years later? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, first of all, let me say many thanks uh, for organizing this uh, uh, event because uh, I think the discussion uh, about uh, the principle of uh, subsidiarity is, is sleeping. It's absolutely sleeping. It's not uh, uh, on the top of the, the priorities of, of uh, European uh, policies. And so um, I think it's good to discuss this question. I agree with uh, most of uh, what uh, Elmar Brock has said. And of course, I, uh, I also agree um, what uh, Madame Steiner said. Um, and um, 
Uh, I only have to look back to the Lisbon Treaty in 2009, um, because uh, I'm since 25 years I'm a member of the Committee of the Regions, and we have a lot of uh, discussions about, uh, of course, uh, about the subsidiarity principle. Uh, and I have to say, we were very hopeful after after the Lisbon Treaty, and we saw some activities uh, within the European countries, with, within the member states, uh, for strengthening the, the, the regionalization, the decentralization. And for me, uh, I mean, the, the subsidiarity principle is, yeah, it is a value, um, uh, and it says, okay, the level who can do it best should uh, implement uh, a competence or, or whatever, or should solve a problem. Uh, so if if the the, the, the municip municipals can uh, solve the problem, they should do it. Uh, if the regions are able to do it best, then they should do it, and so on and so on. Um, I think we we have to discuss this uh, uh, principle of subsidiarity uh, as a principle not only between uh, the European level and the level of the member states. I think very important is the question between uh, the member states and, the, and their regions and their municipalities. And I, I think there has to be done a lot. Um, um, after the uh, financial and economic crisis 2009-2010, we have to see uh, that, uh, that the, the mem especially the member states, uh, they said, okay, decentralization, in combination with uh, with uh, subsidiarity, at the moment it is too expensive. There are economic reasons we cannot we cannot strengthen the the, the subnational level. Uh, and from this time on, nothing happened. Uh, nothing was implemented uh, in the sense of uh, um, subsidiarity. Uh, I have to say this. Uh, um, and the, the 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 next thing is that we have. Uh, so many different systems in, 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 in Europe. Uh, we have uh, the federalistic systems in Austria, in Germany, in perhaps in Belgium, in Switzerland, and so on. But then uh, all the other countries, all the other uh, member states uh, and European countries, they are more or less centralized. And, and this is the problem. Uh, I can see it uh, in, within the Committee of the Regions. Um, if uh, I, from Austria, I'm speaking about subsidiarity and decentralization and so on, some of, of the regional or local representatives of other countries, for example, from France or so, they don't really understand what I mean. And this is the problem. So um, we have a lot uh, to use, a lot of discussions. Um, and. Uh, uh, I'm very happy that Jean-Claude Juncker um, made this task force uh, discussions. Um, I was very sorry about the, the fact that the European Parliament did not participate in this uh, task force, um, because uh, I think that the, the European Parliament should be interested uh, in, in more uh, or in, in implementing and in, in strengthening uh, the subsidiarity principle. And the Austrian presidency in 2018 um, um, organized this uh, subsidiarity conference. Uh, and uh, th since then, I, I would say nothing happened. The new commission, uh, I think, is absolutely not uh, interested in this question. Uh, and subsidiarity is no more a priority within the, the, the program of the, uh, of the commission. Um, yes, uh, Corona, only a few words. Um, I think here is uh, uh, the subsidiarity principle very important. I would say uh, if we speak about a uh, European-wide crisis and pandemic like uh, Corona, of course the, the, the competences of, uh, of uh, Europe, uh, of the European Commission, the European Union should be strengthened. Uh, that's that's absolutely for me no question. I am a federalist and, and I'm for, for decentralization. But in this question, we have seen that the, the, the competences on the European level uh, is uh, is uh, are too small. 
so um, this is, uh, I mean, if you if you um, understand the the principle of subsidiarity correctly, then you have to uh, come to this result that uh, um, some of competences for European wide crisis uh, um, should be strengthened on the European level. Um, I, I, I think uh, the, the, the regions, um, not in all cases during this, this crisis, uh, did a very good job. Uh, and this uh, we should discuss after finishing the, the, the crisis. There was no coordination uh, between the, the, the regions. Uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, egoism and, uh, and whatever. Uh, no solidarity uh, between the, the, the regions and so on. So for, for that reason, um, I, I think uh, the competences on the, on the national level is okay, but uh, not on the European level. This is uh, my first, uh, these are my first remarks uh, according to, um, to this uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sausbergen. Uh, very good uh, points. Now we go to the debate uh, part of our, our panel discussion. So I, I would ask the panelists to keep it short because I cannot intervene here for reasons. So keep it short. But uh, Mr. Sausberger said very interesting, uh, interesting point. Uh, point that where, while this task for discussion during the Austrian presidency was going on, indeed the Parliament, European Parliament, did not want to get engaged. Uh, some thought that, that, that the reason was that there was a fear or concern that maybe the end result of this uh, discussion would be the uh, less powerful European Parliament. So, uh, Mr. Brock, maybe you can react on that because you were in the European Parliament on those times. Uh, what was the reason that uh, the European Parliament was not very, as, as Mr. Schausberger mentioned, why didn't the European Parliament consider the process very interesting? First of all, it was a formal one because this task was was conducted by the Commission, and the European Parliament says we cannot be in a task force which is conducted by one of the institution as it had to be a joint effort. But nevertheless, I was in favor never uh, to, to take part, but others had another opinion uh, in that. Uh, uh, and I would like to so, so to say to have uh, have made it clear, the name of the task force should have been the relation between, uh, relationship between subsidiarity and solidarity to come to the right approach. And here we have to think it broader uh, to make it in a proper way. Mrs. Steiner was very clear, uh, very right, uh, as she said, uh, after she made her private uh, uh, investigations, uh, that uh, this is the question which has to be decided case by case. And there is not a, a clear line, which could be in a constitutional line, what is what where in individual decisions. Uh, the definition of subsidiarity and solidarity is already different between member countries. A rich country has another definition than a poor country. A big country has another definition of that as a small country. Here we have to find common ground and lines where we have to debate that uh, special relationship uh, to come uh, to that result. And when we talk about this Catholic social teaching, that means it exactly that it has to be checked from case by case. And therefore we have in the European uh, tre treaty, three cases of competences. That is the full-fledged European competence. Then the most competences are divided competences and then competences where the European Union has no right to regulate, but it can support. Here, for example, health belongs to, uh, here belongs to uh, education and so on. And here to find the right relationship between, that has to be seen. And I think we should also look into that when it's always said, oh, Europe does too much. Look, there was the British government before the, uh, before the uh, referendum made a check but never published it. It was said, what could we take back from Brussels when we want to stay in the European Union? And made an investigation, they found nothing. The German Employers Association made a, uh, the same study. 
they came not to no result in any proposals on that. Why? When we talk about the internal market, where the most of the aggregations comes, does Europe does too much? What should we do there? When we have to want to have a common market, when we have to have common standards. If we have not common standards, we have again protectionism. And uh, then they have, at the end, no common market anymore. So you have to clarify the fields. You have to make a, a difference between where European Union should have no competences because of the principle of subsidiarity, or whether the European Union does wrong legislation and overdoes it. There are two different issues. For sure, the European Union makes also difficulties, uh, dif uh, mistakes. Uh, but here's the decision. And you have to see uh, if uh, the European Union overdoes its competences, then the Council can all the time correct it. There's no legislation possible without uh, the, the support of the Council. And uh, this has to be taken also into account in that question. But therefore, it would be very good uh, if we had uh, such a, a debate as Franz said it, as it was considered to do in the in the in the task force, but what was not achieved. But also, we should do that between. It would be a good task uh, for the foundations, which have this great day to day, uh, for the Martin Center for the Arnolds uh, and uh, the Austrian uh, uh, Foundation, uh, that uh, we really come together again, go back to the Christian democratic roots from our uh, Christian uh, values, where in our understanding it can be also uh, have other roots uh, in this question of solidarity and, and uh, subsidiarity. How can we be strong, united, or at the same time uh, also strong because we do not centralize everything. Uh, here to find the right mixture and have that also in an intellectual value-based level discussed what we have not done. Tommy, you have asked several times the question, but also from your questions, the word solidarity was never used. Nobody else than myself has used the word solidarity until now, but that is not classical Christian democratic policy. May I give Thank an you. example? May I give an yes. example for what could be subsidiarity or not, huh? as we have to decide it when it will work out. So the the social um, commissioner in Brussels, Mr. Schmidt, gave a kind of frame for an European minimal income. It is not an European income, it's just a frame. And now we had these big discussions. Okay, many nations, for many governments, all. For example, also Austria said, "No, no, no, no. We don't want that. This is not. This is not the competence of the Commission. This is a social affairs. This is a, this is a national competence." But the Commission doesn't give a, a clear, clear numbers, but just a frame. And all the the, the the states should decide by themselves whether they have minimal incomes or whether they have collective bargaining, as Austria has, and it's very successful with that system. But so there is no there is no order from Brussels, but just an order to to get the things done on the social level and to to find common rules, also very general common rules on 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 the minimal income. So and now that's the question: um, Is this subsidiarity? Should should the nation should the, the 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 governments decide all by themselves about their minimal income and then we have still these huge gaps between the richer countries and the poorer countries or should the commission offer a frame within the governments can can act um i don't know <laughs> what will be the answer but um in that case, subsidiarity would mean, no, we don't want the, the offer from the Commission. It, it's our competence. We, the nations, we decide themselves. And in that case, subsidiarity would mean, okay, our national income is our affair. We don't bother about the, the national income in Bulgaria or in, in Luxembourg. It's not of our business. But still, as we are in a common union, as we are in the common internal market, we still have these gaps. But we are we are not working on to minimize these gaps.
Indeed. So to say something? Oh, uh, France. Well, yes. Yeah, I can say a word to that. That's a very good example. It's a, uh, that is a very good example. I have the opinion that we cannot have a European minimum wage with the same amount of money for every country. Uh, because that has to also to do with the relationship uh, of the strength of the national economy. You cannot have the same minimum wage uh, in uh, Denmark as you have it uh, in Romania. It would be economically and socially irresponsible if you would do that. But on the other side to say everyone sh should have a minimum wage in a certain way, that the poorest people are not fall out and we have in the treaty in we should work uh, together that uh, the, uh, the level of wealth is jointly strengthened. Uh, then such a framework would be in order, in order, but then you should leave it to the member countries how they achieve that in detail. Uh, I believe also as Mrs. St as Austria does it, and here we do it in a certain way in Germany with minimum wage, with, which we have since a few years and which does not lead to the total disaster uh, for the economy as the employers association said before in an agreement between stately forced but in an agreement between the social partners as i do it uh, by political decision i think that is economically wrong but what we have to do here that every one country has to have its own opinion, uh, but uh, we have to see also that uh, the Tarifvertrags Treue uh, is not most important. You cannot be against uh, Tarifverträge, also uh, uh, collective bargaining results, uh, if you want also not to have a minimum wage from the state. Because then it's uh, nothing is uh, social justice. And here you have to find a middle way on that, which should be not negotiated. We have this debate in Germany. Some people say because of principles of subsidiarity, it should not be allowed. I do not agree with that. There should be something on a certain level, but only in a sort of a certain frame where we have to discuss how far this frame should go. But we should respect the national systems for collective bargaining and uh, here, therefore, uh, not very much can be done on the European level, but it can give such a frame that every done one does something. So I, what we can say, in, as well, in fact, it's also a political cho choice. There's no objective criteria many times, what should be in the EU level, what should be in the national level. Let's turn around, let's try to be concrete, because Mr. Brooks said something interesting about those studies, you know, what could be taken uh, down to member state level. So let's have a quick round before going to the questions. Do you believe that in the current situation, because that was the UK's task force, one of the tasks, to identify policy issues or policy areas which could be, could be re-delegated to national level. But is that any more realistic? Is it, uh, is it realistic that some issues could be put back or is, uh, has the train already passed? Very quick uh, comments. Let's start with uh, Mr. Schausberger. My, so my, problem is, I, I, my problem is I did not really understand you because the connection was not very, very good. Yeah, very bad. Okay, so I try to repeat. Uh, are there policy issues, policy uh, topics, uh, competencies, political competencies, which can be taken down from the EU level to the national level? Is that any more realistic? Because that, that question often is, is, uh, is made. Yeah, this is, this is uh, I would say, a very <laughs> difficult uh, question and it is not easy to answer. Um, as I said, uh, we should look if there is a problem, uh, which level can solve this problem in, in the best way. And, uh, um, and uh, I, would, I would say this is a, a question of, of, of discussions. Um, it, it's a question um, uh, which competences we, I, I think sometimes we should we should uh, 
uh, put all the competences on, on, on the table and then to discuss um, which competence is uh, on the on the European level, on the on the national level, and on the on the regional level? Um, um, yes, uh, I mean it's 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 really not not very easy to have concrete competences now to uh, give uh, to the European level or down to the to the national level. Um, I think uh, where we should start we should start is the question how to reduce the European uh, bureaucracy. Because I think this is uh, not a question of the treaty. This, this should uh, or could be done. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, this, is, uh, um, this is easier. Or I have one, one other example. Uh, this uh, one in and one out, one out principle to reduce the, 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 the bureaucracy because um, uh, the most uh, critics are coming from from the people and from economy and so on uh, because of, of uh, bureaucracy and uh, so if if uh, the european level uh, will um, have a new uh, a new principle or a new order or whatever a uh, new law uh, then uh, at the same time there should be uh, another um, principle should be um, Cancelled. This is uh, uh, an example uh, which was uh, proposed um, at the subsidiarity conference uh, in in Austria. Um, uh, then, uh, in in specific policy areas, for example, the implementation of existing uh, regulations should have priority over the creation of new regulations. This is also one thing. Um, uh, and uh, sparing uh, use of, of delegated and implementing acts, for example, by the by the council, by the parliament, or, or the the commission. I think this could be uh, easier implemented uh, than uh, changing the the, the, the competences, uh, because uh, changing competences uh, uh, depends on 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 the reform and, and on the change of. Uh, of the treaty, and I, th I I see no chance in the next years that uh, the treaty uh, can be can be reformed or can be can be changed. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Schausberger. I think it you very very clear. Uh, Madam Steinergashi, are they? How do you see that? Are they uh, areas clear areas which could be redelegated re to national level? Well, listen. To me, that uh, answer is not so difficult. The, the, the only uh, political body in, in the European Union that is able or that, it, that has the competence to propose legislation proposal is the European Commission. And then they can propose things, yeah? And then it is, uh, it is up to the states, to the governments, to decide whether they will accept it or not. Or first of all, they have to find a common ground. And if if there is no common ground between the between the national governments, there is no law. There is no law on European level. Point. That's done. And if if the things um, go a good way, and and if um, then the the, po the European Parliament and and the governments, the council, they find a common ground, then something will pass to a European law on a European level. But that means that there has been a long way and a long way to, to, to define and to find a common solution, common ground. And if the nations do not want something that is, uh, that is coming from Brussels, then there, is a, there are ways to prevent it. For example, especially on, on the health sector, on the tax sector, these are all national competences. And it, they will not accept, Austria will not accept if, if Brussel comes now with a law says, that says, okay, you will have to have to tax this or that, then Austria will just simply say no, and it will not work out as you have unanimity on this ground. So I think always if, um, if the government, if the council, that means the 27 states want to have something on the national level, they'll do it. And if not, they will, in most cases, prevent it. So, so what I'm saying... May I add only one sentence? 
uh, if yes, you, you can. because you you asked you you asked for the fields um, given uh, the competences given more to the European level, I'd say uh, we can see it. Uh, every time uh, in, in the question of European security, of course, I would say there is, it is possible and it should be possible to give strong competences to the European level. The second thing is migration, um, because uh, this is uh, unacceptable at the moment and uh, I think uh, Europe needs more uh, competences. And uh, as uh, Madame Steiner said, uh, uh, in, in the field of health politics, I think there is uh, a lot, uh, there are a lot of uh, topics which should be given to the, to the European level. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Pro, from your earlier answer, I, I kind of already understood that you think that the scaling back is not any more realistic, that the facts show that, uh, that it's very difficult to take, uh, uh, take issues back to the uh, state level, member state level. Did, did I understand you correctly? Yeah, if I see the interest of smaller and richer countries, uh, bigger and uh, smaller countries, uh, then you see that it's quite difficult because the way to bring it back is the same procedure to bring it to the European level. It means uh, treaty change with the support of all member countries uh, by uh, ratification by all national parliaments, both ways. And you have to see that. The second point is, uh, yes. look, in, look to taxes. I always was saying, please, no majority voting on taxes. That should be national responsibilities. I've changed my mind in certain questions. When we need a digital tax, I believe that Amazon and Google should pay taxes in Europe. And this cannot be done on a national level. Austria cannot do alone a digital tax. Uh, against the United States. Together we might have the strength or transaction taxes. We have decided now with the Corona package that there should be more own resource on the European level to uh, pay back the debts. Then you have to do that to use that instrument. Have you not changed the opinion that in a digital age we have to come in these tax questions only on that question where it's needed, but it's important for the internal market. Uh, that in such few taxes, there should be re European competence in that question to do that. Uh, that is the question we have now to consider. Uh, migration, the European Union has mostly the competence, but are not the, 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 the effectiveness to do it. We have reached in the Treaty of Lisbon majority voting in the questions of migration. It was used only once because the member states have refused to use the right. It was only used once in the question of distribution of migrants. And then the member states like Hungary and Poland have said, no, we do not expect that. That's the other way around where it goes wrong. We uh, have to see. Uh, last point, uh, but I very much agree with Franz Schausberger on the question of bureaucracy. Here can be done a lot. First of all, where Europe has competences, it has not to be used this competence in every detail. But that is not so much a question of competence, but of behavior and politics. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, what uh, uh, Franz said about delegated and implementing acts, it's totally true, but that is not only European bureaucracy. That is the relationship between European and national bureaucrats. With that method, both the European Parliament and the national parliaments are fucked. Sorry for that word. And, uh, and uh, we have to bring that to the open arena, to the open arena. And it should be not possible that bureaucrats, both in Brussels and the national capitals, come in that delegate and implemented act to a situation that they do much more than it was foreseen in the legislation itself. And here we have to change that uh, and to, to weaken the powers. And here I think sometimes I have the feeling that the national bureaucracies in their negotiations with Brussels are more eager to have it not in the open uh, landscape than the Brussels bureaucracy. But here it's a very interesting field to debate it. 
and uh, France, we should have some common ideas on that. Tackling bureaucracy. Great. We are uh, slowly coming to the last, very last part of our interesting panel. I have some questions, a couple of questions which I, which I will put on the table. So, so first of all, there is uh, it is actually three which I read here from Connor um, McArdle. How can the new government overcome the difference between federal and centralized states to best be there for the citizens? But I think we have quite already, you, you have answered uh, already the, to that question in a couple of places. Then there's a, what is the impact of COVID on understanding subsidiarity? And then uh, and he has also a second uh, question. Could lack of rule of law be considered as a factor triggering the action of the EU in the area where our member state do not deliver? So very interesting. This also this value aspect, where it's very difficult to put a clear lines. So is the rule of law kind of weaker? Could such a country be considered not effective in fulfilling its competencies? So let's do it uh, now. Let's do the uh, we starting order. So we go to from uh, Mr. Brock again, and then we finish with Mr. Schausberger. So, Mr. Brock, your yours is for I believe uh, when you see it in the question of uh, COVID, there should be mostly in health uh, national responsibility, but in cases of pandemics, we have to do more in helping each other in question of resilience of a health system that we have to do in certain of pandemics, for example, what was discussed uh, here by my Austrian colleagues, uh, the question, what should we do with the borders? How should we behave there? Where we need coordination? I think it was a disaster that in the beginning, Germany did not deliver uh, 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 security measures, uh, this uh, uh, Anzüge this, uh, for, for uh, doctors and so on to Italy which was changed and now we have done a lot that we have now ordered jointly the vaccines on a European level, uh, which was not foreseen in February, March. And this I think shows that in certain questions we should do it together, but how it, uh, it's uh, done on a local level, how they organize uh, the uh, bringing the vaccine, vaccine to the people, how the hospitals are worked, that is not, should not done from Brussels. The question of of uh, of uh, the rule of law. The rule of law is a principle which is taken as a condition for membership in the European Union. Democracy and the rule of law means the division of power, the controls, uh, the right of minorities, also political minorities in Parliament, uh, media freedom. These are common values. How that is done. In a two-chamber system, how uh, the question on the role of a constitutional court is, in which way, but the principle must be there, that the independence of the judicial system is there and not in the hands of the majority, uh, of, uh, uh, which is just in a country in order to protect itself. We see it in these days, how important these principles are, divide all the differences in the United States. Um, it shows again, Despite the behavior of Trump, the United States is a country of the check and balances with the independent judicial system. And how helpful that is that not uh, a government which has the power in the moment uh, can take all the powers also from the other uh, institutions which are partly there to control. The rule of law is very much not to help the government, the rule of law is to protect the citizens against the state. And that, I think, is very principled. How that is done in a different orders, that is not European issue. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Um, Madam Steiner Gassi, the same issue, COVID, uh, you already mentioned, you already spoke about that, but uh, you have commented on this rule of, of law, uh, uh, or do you agree with Mr. Brock said? How do you see that? 
Well, I guess uh, in terms of health and in Corona, I am absolutely convinced that the European Union has to cooperate much more and that the governments have to cooperate much more. And I still don't see why it is so difficult from, for, between the states to recognize, for example, the tests. If I go if I go from Austria to Belgium, Belgium will not recognize my, my COVID-19 test, which is absolutely not understandable. This is just stupid to be asked, to be honest. Eh? And, and the same thing with travel. They accept Belgium. all the ones, but not from Ischgl. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. From all Austria. From Angle, every single test. Only for Ischgl. Uh, so, Anyway, there is much more necessary to cooperate. And on the other side, as the Brock said, rule of law, there is there's nothing you can... This is, a, 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 as it was said, is a precondition to be to enter into the European Union and to have the guarantee that this right stays the same. And this is, of course, each and every nation has to, to take care of itself, of its rule of law. But this, and, and it's not the Commission who can impose um, yeah. the rule of law. But every every state has to guarantee it of itself. Thank you. And Mr. Schausberger, you have the floor, commenting on the, the questions from the audience, or maybe commenting on the yeah. previous uh, speakers. Mr. Schausberger. Thank you very much. I hope the connection is working. Um, um, only a few words uh, about this question. I think uh, uh, it was it was necessary that the, the national governments and the national parliaments um, had to reduce, I would say, democracy and freedom of the people during the, the, the crisis. I think this is in some in some fields it is it is necessary. But I also hope. Uh, that we will come back as soon as possible after the crisis, after the Corona crisis, to the to the status before uh, the crisis. This is absolutely necessary. Uh, we have to look at uh, at the country with uh, populistic and uh, authoritarianism and so on, uh, because uh, uh, populism and authoritarianism does not like subsidiarity. Uh, they, they are. Uh, centralistic regimes and they don't want to with the, with the sub-national level uh, and so uh, sometimes we had the impression that they used the situation of corona uh, to, to, to strengthen uh, centralism but uh, I, I'm very hopeful and I think we'll come back uh, to the, the situation before to, to the same level of democracy to the same uh, freedom level of freedom of, of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our time is up. Uh, we have had very interesting uh, discussion, maybe just surely maybe to three points. I think if you, if you listen to our, our panelists, one thing is very clear. I, I think the, uh, the common sense or common feeling was that the subsidiarity is very central and important value, but it is a value which, which is a base of, uh, of action. Also, as mentioned, subsidiarity is, is, question, is a question of public political choice. Many times there is no objectivity. It is, uh, as mentioned by pan panelists, for example, compare France to Germany uh, or the other countries. There are different interpretations which sometimes pose uh, challenges. And thirdly, which came very clearly, is that the, the pragmatic uh, uh, point. A special point was made on bureaucracy, how we can work on that. And, you know, one comes in, one goes out, principle. I guess that's the, our three panelists' uh, recommendation for the Future of Europe uh, uh, conference going to come up, that the subsidiarity is an essential element. I would like to thank you, you all, audience, the panelists for the very interesting discussion, of course, uh, Political Academy of, of Austria People's Party and Conrad, our foundation for hosting it panel. It has been an exciting uh, debate. and. and and we will, uh, we will uh, continue. There will be next uh, panel is digital transformation as a geopolitical challenge for uh, for Europe in uh, 50 minutes. Audience, stay tuned. Um, there will be a very interesting discussion. Once again, audience, thank you for holding our debate and panelists. 
so much, uh, so much thank you for participating and contributing and preparing to this very interesting uh, debate. And so um, thank you and see you very soon. Bye bye.